Janet Sakir with us. This meeting is being recorded and or transcribed. All right, we're recording. Okay, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board in Vermont. Uh, it's 9.30, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. Um, just a few administrative details. We have made our most important hire to date. Um, earlier this morning, Nellie Marvel accepted the position of administrative coordinator for the board. She's been an integral part of our team since our inception and um, has been such an important thought partner to us as we move through these early stages of our work. So thank you, Nellie, for accepting and thank you for joining the team. You're very welcome. Officially. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've also hired our general counsel. Um, he's still making his personal notifications. So I'm going to um, build the suspense for one more week before I announce uh, his name. Um, but a great, um, a great asset to the state and to the board. So um, today uh, really marks an important milestone in the evolution of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, when Kyle Julie and I started in these roles back in April. It was really just the three of us with our laptops and a 100-page document to sift through. Um, we didn't have a staff, an office, an advisory committee, or really any sort of personal acquaintance with one another. Um, and of course, the pandemic further complicated um, what was already a complicated process of meeting each other, developing a plan and a vision for how to proceed and um, of course the just nuts and bolts of starting a new state agency from scratch. Um, so we decided early on just to dive into the substance of cannabis policy and learn all that we could from the people that are the true experts in this field. Um, Kyle uh, built a website for us. Julie prepped all the kind of behind the scenes memoranda we needed to hire Nellie. And Nellie got us online and organized to start holding meetings. Um, and I can't thank the three of you enough for all, you know, dropping everything you were doing um, at the time, um, all the sacrifices that you made, and um, and all the support you've shown each other and me uh, as we, you know, as we get to this point in our work. Um, since then, uh, we've been holding weekly meetings um, on issues that we believe are at the core of an effective, safe, and equitable cannabis marketplace. Um, fortunately for us, Vermonters care deeply about this endeavor and um, sincerely want to help this inaugural board um, act responsibly and prudently as we try to craft the initial conditions of this industry. So I can't thank all the people that have provided testimony to us, um, submitted public comment, written to the board, watched our meetings, and helped us find our way forward. Um, and. Uh, I'd also just note um, that while this is a significant point for the board, this is uh, just a moment in time uh, with respect to cannabis policy in the United States. Um, so many people have sacrificed both willingly and unwillingly to destigmatize this plant and end the criminalization of it. And I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have paid a price, either with their reputation or with their liberty, um, to end the war on drugs. So we are at a pivot point in our work. We're gonna shift our focus today to consolidating the testimony that we've heard into a vision statement for the board. Then we're gonna to attempt to lay out a plan for how we intend to work with our advisory committee and our consultants in order to meet the reporting requirements in Act 164 and 62 and how um, we're really gonna develop a regulatory framework for the adult and medical use programs in Vermont. So I'll get into greater detail on those later in the agenda, um, but next week's meeting on Wednesday, uh, August 18th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. will be with our full advisory committee. Um, and the physical location for now um, is the Waterbury State Office Complex. Um, and so please feel free to attend in public. Um, it's gonna be an important meeting for us. So with that, I would, as everyone reviewed the draft minutes from our meeting on July 29th? Yes. Yes. I take a motion to approve the minutes. I move to approve the 
approve the minutes from the last meeting. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, so we are going to shift now to drafting our board mission and vision statement. Um, so as I mentioned, we've heard uh, extensive testimony on the seven priorities that we identified uh, with the help of some of the lead sponsors of the bill in Act 164 and Act 62. I thought what would be helpful for us to do today would be to um, look at those seven priorities and think about all of the testimony that we've heard on those priorities and really start to um, draft kind of some guiding principles that might help us, um, you know, as a touchstone that we can always refer back to as we make um, some really important and, and really um, foundational decisions um, in the coming weeks and months. So um, uh, I have, uh, let me just pull up some of my notes. So we have a mission statement that's embedded in Act 164, um, and I think that we should certainly start with that, uh, which is the Cannabis Board is an independent commission created within the effect executive branch to safely, equitably, and effectively implement and administer the laws enabling adult use and medical use of cannabis in Vermont. So that, of course, um, is our mission. Um, but as we know, it goes, those, those words on the page have a lot of meaning and a lot of depth to them. And um, I think that what we should do is focus on our seven priorities and start talking just amongst ourselves um, about what, what, those, what those priorities mean and what those words mean. So essentially, um, you know, the first, the first piece uh, that we took testimony on the very first, you know, the very first meeting on this kind of list of thematic meetings was on the legacy market and small cultivators and how we can prioritize them and create a welcoming environment for them to enter the regulated space. And so I don't know, I, I'm going to have an open conversation with Kyle, you and Julie, um, just about what we learned from that kind of that meeting and what we've learned about how to kind of encourage, um, the legacy market and the small cultivators in. And so please feel free to kind of jump in and mm -hmm. with your kind of takeaways. Um, I think among my top takeaways from that particular meeting were the lab concerns, um, access to uh, lab testing and the number of labs available, um, and then barriers to entry, which really I think we'll probably talk about a lot. It'll uh, go through a lot of our priorities, I think. Um, and then the ease of folks who are in the legacy market to move into the regulated market um, and lowering the barriers there. Those were probably my two, two top takeaways along with some of the innovations that the small cultivators have. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly agree with Julie. I think those are major takeaways. You know, I've got some, some stuff in my notes, some, some data that we've heard anecdotally that has been collected around Vermont, 85% would support local, locally owned businesses versus corporate outlets. 65% um, of folks that were polled, testing is important but could be prohibitive. Um, I think it's important to keep those in the back of our mind as we look to incentivize, or excuse me, uh, help small cultivators really enter this marketplace. It needs to be fair and equitable reasonable zoning laws, the municipal and, and the state level, um, reasonable fees, Julie mentioned affordable testing, and how we can work to further drill in and define uh, what canopy size might actually look like um, with respect to how it was defined in Act 164. So, you know, from my perspective, I think there's a lot of folks out there that that are happy that 164 made it across the finish line. I think there's still some anxiety or hesitation around Act 164 and how it might work to to help small cultivators. Um, but I've been I've been excited from what I've heard and and what's found in Act 164 that really can help us work to provide a good platform for small cultivators. Yeah, just to kind of build on some of 
what you all said, and th these are more thematic, not really drilling down to specifics, but essentially um, a regulated adult use marketplace will not be successful in Vermont if it's inaccessible to legacy cultivators and the people who specialize in small Vermont scale growing practices. Uh, access to land and access to capital are the fundamental obstacles for small cultivators. Um, access to capital is further burdened by federal prohibition and the lack of traditional banking options. Access to land is burdened by commercial land use requirements and zoning restrictions. Um, you know, the exorbitant fees, we, we've touched on this, a complicated application process and overly prescriptive regulatory requirements. Um, any sort of kind of arbitrary testing and environmental and security requirements are, are major barriers to entry for small businesses. Um, one thing that I always come back to uh, also is just that federal legalization, you know, if and when it happens, will result in dramatic changes to the market. And Vermont really needs to focus on what it does well uh, in order to be competitive when that happens. And to me, that's really craft cultivation, um, the Vermont on, honoring the Vermont brand that has been developed, uh, you know, with respect to organics and sustainability, um, uh, envir uh, environmental stewardship, and um, those are the things that will really set us apart um, from, you know, the the mega grow operations and wherever they pop up. Um, you know, just a few more, I guess, specific ones are just that we have some incredible resources um, at UVM Extension and the Intervale um, and some models there that can really help incubate small cultivators, new businesses, um, help growers understand best practices and help with business planning. Um, and then finally, yeah. The yeah, go ahead, Kyle. I was just going to jump jump in there, you know, um, from my experience coming from the agency of agriculture and, and working with a lot of folks that are working in diversified farming operations, there's always going to, you know, Vermont, this, for better or worse, has always had to operate in those niche quality markets, um, especially in commodities that are that are handled at the at the more federal level, we only have so much control over what happens at the federal level. And you know, there is that demonstrated experience that we've, as you mentioned, Chairman Pepper, the Intervale Center, other great organizations in the state have really worked to, to help people succeed while operating on razor thin margins. And I think um, drawing from some of that experience and, and utilizing a lot of our, our partners, our public private partners in the state, um, we at least have a little bit of that foundational aspect here that can really help incubate these base businesses as they look to add, as, as smaller ones look to add, you know, this emerging market to their diversified portfolio on farm. Yeah, and on that note, uh, my last just bullet point was just that creative license types um, can also help improve access to land, reduce costs. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking like the cooperative licenses the seed or nursery licenses that we've heard about, um, allowing people to co-locate, allowing farmers to co-locate, um, requiring business incubation, those types of those types of issues can really be a benefit towards small cultivators that are trying to enter. Yeah, again, ditto, again, sorry, Julie, again, just really quickly, ditto on my last comment. Fortunately, folks in this, in the broader ag and, and commercial space have experience on those special, you know, business situations and license types. And, and we can draw in anecdotally from those to really help make sure that, that we're doing this correctly. I was just going to add cottage licenses to that production that can be done on small scale, um, particularly considering the number of people that have left the workforce during COVID-19, particularly women. And the cannabis industry has not been um, immune to that. There were something like 37% of CEOs in the cannabis industry were women, and now it's, it's down by something like 10%. So um, those types of licenses that people can achieve and then work within their lives is 
think useful to this conversation? Well, um, Bryn, you've heard all of that. Uh, do you want to <laughs> try your best at trying to consolidate it into a statement or a number of statements? We don't have to, there's no, you know, there's no vision. I mean, there's no uh, template for what we're doing, yep. so. Yeah, I'd love to. So I, this, one is, um, this one is a biggie. I think it, there was uh, strands of this that were woven through every meeting you had. Um, I think you could say a lot in a vision statement about uh, the legacy market and small cultivators. Um, but this one I see is, is um, we could craft a pretty general statement here that's pretty all-encompassing. So I think something like uh, the, the board seeks to encourage small cultivators and entrepreneurs in the legacy market to enter the regulated market by reducing barriers to entry and facilitating innovation. That sounds great. Um, sounds good. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, my my thinking on this, just uh, for your benefit, Julie and Kyle, and, and please like add to the conversation, is that we try to get some basic sentences or paragraphs for each one of these priorities, and then kind of think on them, talk to some um, relevant stakeholders about them, just to make sure that we're actually and seek public comment and public input um, and uh, and try and narrow them down may maybe for next week um, and make sure that we're trying to really capture what we're trying to capture in them. Yeah. So I'm going to move on only because we have seven and we've only set aside 45 minutes for this. But uh, the next meeting that we had on a specific priority was around social equity. And so I'd open it up um, to just kind of the key takeaways from, from that meeting, but also just throughout all of our witnesses and, and anything that we've done um, or any, any of the people we've talked to on social equity. Julie, do you wanna start? Sure, I was just looking at my notes. So, um, you know, I think my key takeaways from this particular meeting were about being inclusive in the process, um, but also to be slow and thoughtful. Um, and take a measured approach and then to think now about the type of data we want to collect to sort of demonstrate success and to prepare to retool that there will be steps forward and steps back and that we need to be prepared to be flexible uh, and retool as much as possible um, and then the broadness of a social equity definition um, again trying to be as inclusive as possible I think those are my key key takeaways along with um, being knowledgeable and educated and can and consider the past systemic policy issues and how that might play into decision making that happens today yeah I, I agree with with julie i think she pretty much hit the nail on the head the only thing that i would add is we need to be when we look to define social equity applicant we need to be broad but we also need to be specific at the same time just so folks do understand if they are a social equity applicant and how they would qualify you know, for being one, I've I've heard active versus um, passive when it comes to a social equity applicant. Active being somebody um, who experienced the war on drugs themselves versus more of of a passive role in the war on drugs, you know, pandemic for lack of a better way to describe it, um, where a parent or a family member may have um, been arrested or convicted and that trickle down effect on, on how that affected somebody's lives. So um, helping people unpack what that means and how they qualify and educating folks on as, as giving as clear guidance as we possibly can um, to help folks uh, completely understand that element of our program. Yeah, totally agree on that. I mean, I think it was Bo Kilmer um, who mentioned that, you know, that you wanna be broad but you want to be specific as well just like you said Kyle because you don't want to be giving priority or privileges to folks that don't that, that don't need it um, and so yeah I agree with that um, the thing my key takeaways and this is going to sound redundant to what has been said already just that equity in Vermont should include more intersectionality than merely race and ethnicity um, it could also include sex gender identity or expression 
agricultural equity, socioeconomic, geographic, and by that kind of rural versus urban. Um, you know, Susanna told us to think about, you know, kind of academic achievement as well. Um, Bo talked a lot about health equity um, and generational equity. Um, equity should be considered in every decision the board makes, not just re with respect to specific uh, social equity programming. Um, uh, one thing, you know, determining actual ownership of a social equity applicant um, can be a very convoluted process. I think we heard, you know, David Silverman and um, a few others, uh, Shaleen Title, talk about, um, you know, there's things that there's managing contracts that, that can prop up a social equity applicant, but not actually give them the authority to own own the company. Um, uh, affiliate ownership, beneficial ownership. Um, you know, we need to think very uh, intensely about what um, indicia of control, this is a Silverman um, piece, uh, we want to require and what will be disclosed publicly. Um, uh, just a word on criminal history records. Um, you know, expungement, uh, I know from experience, is a deeply complex process and not available to everyone who might be technically eligible. Um, and so the use of criminal history records by the board to disqualify an applicant should be very narrow. Um, and we should really focus on, um, you know, the folks that presently pose a threat to public safety or the proper functioning of the regulated market as the um, legislation spells out. And really um, think about the policies of expungement and, and why the legislature allows expungement is because the value of a criminal history record diminishes over time, um, and the predictive value, I should say. So, so really, you know, we should be thinking very closely about um, how we're going to use those. Um, uh, something that has been brought up is start small, sl slow and steady, and, and plan for mid-course correction and analysis. Um, and. Uh, Another piece that came to mind is just that the municipalities do not have the same equity mandate that was in Act 164 and Act 62. And so we should do our best to assist um, the local municipalities with model ordinances and guidance um, that will ensure um, equitable access. And, um, and then just the one thing that, that always sticks with me is just that moving quickly and promoting social equity are very often opposing forces. Um, and the faster that we move, the more we'll default to kind of traditional business as usual that usually favors large, larger corporations, well-capitalized well corporations. I think too, thinking a little bit more broadly that it's at some point we can think about equity and what we can do to encourage equity within the industry in terms of how hiring happens or what education we can provide on equitable hiring and then um, you know when businesses are contracting with with marketing companies or accountants you know thinking equitably about how um, this affects ancillary businesses I don't think I don't know but I don't yeah. think everyone who has a past cannabis charge necessarily wants to be directly right. in the industry so there might be opportunities that are right. you know ancillary they want to, to it. install HVAC systems right or, yeah. whatever that yeah. is yep yeah, that's a that's a great one. Social equity is not just about license ownership; it's uh, it's about community reinvestment. It's about a benefit to folks that have been harmed. Echoing everything that you both just said. So, um, Bryn, do you have enough there to kind of think through? I mean, I know that trying to consolidate it on the fly is not easy. No, um, it's not. <laughs> um, but the, it's. I think. I think I have um, a, a few sentences here that um, can summarize a lot of what you just shared. This is obviously another um, big one that could be talked about for pages and pages. But um, here's what I've got. The board acknowledges the disproportionate impact of the policies created in the war on drugs particularly those that impact BIPOC and economically and educationally disadvantaged communities. 
The board aspires to play a part in repairing the harm created by the prohibition of cannabis by building a program that is equitable and accessible. The board will prioritize inclusivity and data gathering in the process of building that program to have the ability to course correct and demonstrate success. I think it's great. Yep. You're really good on the fly, Bryn. Yeah. <laughs> um, my only question, is, can you say the part about play a part in repairing? The board aspires to play a part in repairing the harm created by the prohibition of cannabis. I wonder if we want to use a different word than repair. I don't know if we can repair the harm, right? Mm -hmm. I've, that might yeah. be too advantageous. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's mitigating or reduce future harm or, or something yeah. like that. Good point. I'm going to use the word mitigate instead. Okay. Yeah. That's so now it says the, the board aspires to play a part in mitigating the harm created by the prohibition of cannabis. Okay. That sounds great. So moving along, and I know that this feels like it's happening very quickly. Um, for the benefit of people watching, you know, we sent our notes to Bryn earlier so that she could get a sense of what 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 we were thinking with respect to each of these. But we haven't shared them with each other, and so this is um, kind of important for us uh, to do as a board to really understand um, what's going to be driving our decision making. Um, so our next uh, priority was really around energy considerations and environmental and land use considerations. Um, Kyle, did you want to take the lead on kind of your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I have a lot of <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on this. I'll try and keep it um, at an overview level for for Bryn's benefit. You know, I, I think energy and environmental issues are really at the core of, of what we need to do as, as a board. I think all of us are cognizant that in Act 164, we have a lot of a lot of um, power to help small applicants or small cultivators and, and others. One thing that we really don't have the ability to waive as a board for for any license type is environmental and energy considerations and how any size operation might put um, stress on our our regional grid, um, our mediums like air, water, so on and so forth. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's it's important that the board recognizes that um, indoor growing versus outdoor growing puts different stresses on our environment. I think that needs to be acknowledged. There's a lot of benefits that um, cultivating cannabis can also bring for our environment, especially uh, from an outdoor perspective, how it uptakes nitrogen, how it can operate in, in buffer zones um, to prevent further runoff. Um, so I think that's you know extremely, extremely important that the board makes that um, known as we as we craft our vision statement. Julie, do you want to? Yeah, add to I, I think the only thing, the two things I would add to that are. Um, municipal zoning because there are some towns in Vermont that have fully built out uh, zoning departments and then some that don't have zoning at all um, and what that means for land use um, in the in the commercial designation of the product and then also um, considerations as it relates to cost as Kyle was talking about the energy stress is different between indoor and outdoor growing and so is the cost yeah I think that's a fundamental thing that we need to understand while we can't waive a lot of these things that compliant regulatory compliance uh, and fee structures are, are pretty serious barriers to entry um, so yeah on, on this piece you know I, I mentioned uh, in the past that I've, I've been a long time advocate for um, legalizing and, and regulating cannabis but you know my faith really did get shaken in whether this is a good idea or not uh, when we heard from efficiency Vermont and the Public Service Department and um, you know just we heard about the potentially devastating impacts of controlled environment agriculture and hydroponic growing um, and so I agree that we need to do um, what we can to encourage and facilitate outdoor and mixed light growing. Um, 
uh, I don't need to review a lot of the statistics, but we heard a, you know, the Efficiency Vermont told us, you know, the, the some really devastating statistics about um, controlled um, environment agriculture and the equivalent of, you know, three million new cars on the road or six billion dollars in annual energy costs. Um, uh, one thing that I that I think is really important is that industry participants, particularly small cultivators, understand the goals of our regulatory framework and the underlying intent, and then they help us achieve those goals. You know, we're not overly prescriptive. They can kind of help us understand um, how they can meet, you know, these kind of environmental and energy benchmarks um, that we that we create, so that so that they can kind of be part of the solution and they're helping us. Um, can I jump uh, in for, for, for yeah. one second and just compound on that? Because I think that that's vital. I think one of the things that we need to do as a board is create a, a regulatory foundation, a regulatory framework or floor from an environmental and energy context. And also, you know, make sure folks are, are meeting the spirit of those regulations, um, but allow for room for third party sort of fires, um, whether it's cannabis specific ones or NOFA Vermont or other sustainability certifications that a business might seek to further define and, and help um, separate their products at a market level. So it, it's going to be, you know, we, we've, as you, as you mentioned, we need folks to come in and help us not only meet goals, but, but knock those goals out of the park um, to the extent that we're able. Yeah. And I think there's some understanding of the benefit as well uh, to outdoor growing. I think the, one of the notes I had is that one acre of outdoor grow could sequester 4.2 tons of carbon. Yeah. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, and um, I think um, back to jumping back to one of the points you made earlier, earlier, Julie, earlier, Julie, this being a designated a commercial product and trying to incentivize outdoor growing, outdoor growing. I, still um, I still think we've got a lot to learn, lot to learn on how that interplay is at the municipal zoning level. Um, you know, what, what you know, commercially, what commercially does somebody, does somebody need to take their farm out of current use if they want to pursue more than a craft cultivator license? license. What, um, what um, commercially zoned tracts of, of land are there right now, right now um, that have been soil, um, that have been soil tested, tested and, and, and are, are, are great for growing this product in? There's a lot of these outstanding, outstanding questions that we need to understand, I think, I think um, how this commercial how designation fits in from an outdoor growing perspective and and how, and how municipalities, municipalities can help us there. And jumping off from that, Kyle, there's also like wastewater, so the runoff, the water use, all of those pieces that municipalities, some municipalities will handle. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and, you know I, think, I think we've heard, we've heard um, um, you know, from ANR you know, and, and BAFM and, you know, and typically the you know, agency of ag are the, the, the folks out on, on fields, on fields that, are zoned that are zoned current use, use and, and, and what's the interplay going to be like with, with, ANR, and with ANR, ANR and their expertise when it comes to, when it comes to um, helping, us understand helping us understand some of these wastewater issues if it's under their jurisdiction as a commercial product. So working with our state agency partners to understand potential pitfalls that we may run into because I'm not sure that there's a very a clean glide path, for, glide us path for us to follow from another product designation, product designation like, this, like this where it's, it's kind of it's kind of not an agricultural not an agricultural product, product but it's, it's growing in, in soil, in, in soil. <laughs> you know so, so. yeah I, and it would be uh it, it's this doesn't necessarily fit into this uh this um mission and vision statement but i, I just have to acknowledge that we have incredible partners at Efficiency Vermont that have seen the writing on the wall. They've anticipated these these issues for years now. And I just was so impressed by the amount of incentives and the amount of intensity that they've put into um, creating programs for uh, cultivation, cannabis cultivation, and, and assisting um, farmers with greenhouse design, um, you know, providing incentives for uh, thermal curtains and uh, um, HVAC systems, um, smart controls, the things that really can reduce the energy demand. Um, and so, yeah, um, one thing that Jacob mentioned also, which is kind of a really narrow point, but worth mentioning, I think, is that um, permitting weather contingency planning, which can at times run afoul of seed to sale tracking, but can um, really uh, allow for 
outdoor cultivators to feel confident that they can bring their plants inside if there's going to be a frost and things like that. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, things that we can do to really um, try to encourage outdoor cultivation. Anything we can do in that realm is important to me. And yes, in relying on ANR, I mean, one of the key takeaways that I had from their presentation was that they have programs out there to educate and support um, you know, local folks with regulatory compliance. I mean, we need to make sure that people understand how to comply and that it's easy to comply. Yeah, I mean, bouncing off of that, I, I'm, I'm all for education before enforcement. If we're not doing a good job um, educating the public on, on our expectations for this program, then some of that falls completely on us and not, not the person who's maybe well-intended, but um, not, not up to regulation or up to code with respect to certain environmental or energy standards. And perhaps there's even education before licensing. I, you know, I can see a scenario where, and particularly in this area, it could be so complicated that someone just decides not to participate. Right. And I don't, I think that's to your point. Right. That's not what we want. Right. You know, it's important here, it, and even jumping back to the small cultivator conversation, not completely, but, but very, very briefly, I do not want folks to feel like they need to, every single time they have a question, seek legal assistance or business advice or assistance. It needs to be, to the extent that we're able, something that folks can really feel confident in, in doing without having to pay all those additional costs. Bryn, do you have a sense of how to move forward on this one? I do. Okay, so I've got a few sentences for this one. Um, Vermont can be a trailblazer in the national market by establishing a program that prioritizes environmental stewardship as a foundational principle. As a result, the board has a fundamental responsibility to encourage and facilitate outdoor and mixed light growing over controlled environment indoor cultivation. The board will endeavor to educate stakeholders on the goals and intent of the regulatory framework and support industry participants to achieve those goals. That sounds great to me. Yeah. Sounds comprehensive to me. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, we have about 12 minutes left on our agenda, but I think we should just kind of blow through uh, uh, the next item on our agenda and keep going. Um, so I don't want to short circuit the conversation. Um, the next uh, the next piece is youth prevention and education. And I'll just start. Um, so the trends in harm perception and usage ease of access are moving in the wrong direction. They have been for a number of years in Vermont. Um, uh, some of the statistics that we heard, uh, I'll just summarize, is that legalized states have shown either no or minor increases, uh, or sorry, they've shown increases in the 21 plus population as far as usage. They've shown minor or no increase in adolescent or young adult usage, which I think is an important thing to, to have on our record. Uh, that was from um, Dr. Volante's uh, a presentation, but that in Nevada at least, and I don't know about other states, but in Nevada, um, they're seeing early earlier initiation ages. So people are starting to use cannabis for the first time at younger ages, um, which is troubling. Um, there is, there's, we've seen some recent trends that in legalized states, there's a decrease in binge drinking. Um, so there might be some kind of substitution effect happening um, by the 21 plus, um, but there is also been shown to be um, potentially increases in sedative misuse. Um, we have uh, Pace Vermont um, in Vermont has been funded to um, track how policy changes um, are impacting behavior and uh, they've done um, a tremendous job looking at cannabis use, um, digging in much deeper than some of the behavioral risk surveys. Um, let's see. So uh, there's huge amounts of gaps in services around the state. Um, 
in with respect to prevention and you know that's uh, a result of most of them being federally funded and as priorities shift federally um, these programs even if they're incredibly successful can just disappear overnight um, and so I think that that um, investment in prevention is a critical piece um, there's very few prevention programs or campaigns designed specifically at young adults which is the 18 to 21 age and um, let's see I think that just that the after school piece also is pretty important um, just I think that the statistic that Holly gave us was that uh, only 50%, roughly 50% of the demand for after school programs uh, can be met by our current services. So that's, that kind of sums up uh, the, some of the key takeaways that I had from the Prevention and Education Week that we did. And on that with the after school, it's those hours that they find are the highest risk taking hours, the 3 to 5 p.m., so between school and, and the time when parents or adults are home. Um, and then, I, so my takeaways, and I'm not, I, I think I need a little bit more education about zoning in general, but you know, in terms of towns and what they can do in terms of zoning and, and what would be you know, within our purview and what would be within theirs. Um, but then also, uh, for takeaway for me was about consumer behavior and how much advertising can affect consumer behavior. Um, not so much the location or the you know the existence of a retail operation or a or a production operation, but the actual how it's advertised and and the messaging that comes with that was probably the overall biggest takeaway that I had, um, along with the um, the statistics that showed that health warnings work and that Canada has the gold standard for health warnings that they um, change those health warnings on a regular basis to keep them um, new and and continue to keep people reading them. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said thus far. A couple of additional things that, that stuck out uh, for me were I'm hearing about uh, six the six points on prevention strategies, you know, education and skill building, access, community norms, um, support and early screening, physical design, and et cetera. And how do we and our policies fit into these already established and in use uh, prevention strategies? And then uh, Julie mentioned zoning, I think. It's going to be obviously important um, for municipalities and the board to to understand interaction and expectations of each other. Uh, point of sale training for owners, managers, workers at the retail level and at the cultivation level as well, and compliance checks. You know, education before enforcement, but you know, at the point of sale, I think it's going to be important that we have some type of a compliance check and training. Um, for folks to make sure that that youth prevention is is top of mind when anybody's in their retail establishment. Yeah. Brenda, did you want to take a stab at this one? Yep. Okay. So the board acknowledges the effects of cannabis use on the cognitive and emotional development for youth and young adults. To this end, the board will endeavor to develop a program that deters cannabis use among youth and educates consumers on the risks involved in cannabis consumption. I think that's great. I think that kind of bridges the gap between what we can do as a board and what needs to be done as we move into a legalized system. Yeah, absolutely. Get up. Um, consumer protection. Uh, Kyle, did you want to get started on this? I, I really thought that maybe the um, the day that we did with Stephanie in the labs was kind of most dedicated to consumer protection, but feel free to kind of bring in any anything that you, you know or anything that you've learned about this. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you're spot on. I think consumer protection and, and this is one of those other other unique areas that I think touches upon everything that all of our other main priorities as well. Right. But that's going to start even at, at the well, I guess really at the point of cultivation, but I think what you're getting at is is lab testing and how uh, from an environmental perspective, testing for heavy metals, mycotoxins, um, and so on and so forth can, can really help to make sure that what we're doing is uh, putting a safe product out on, on retail shops. And, and what that means for me is, is, 
you know, making sure that we're something that is is being offered to the public is safe. But what does the shelf life also look on that product? And and we need to make sure that we understand um, certain things there. You know, it's it's interesting to me because uh, testing is so vital, I think, to this consumer protection element, along with youth prevention strategies, child safe packaging, so on and so forth. Um, but it's cost prohibitive um, to a lot of folks that want to enter this marketplace. So what can we as a board, how can we get creative to ensure consumer protection, but not overly burden folks that are trying to enter this marketplace with additional costs? Um, and that's something that we've got to keep in the back of our minds as we look uh, to build out this program. Um, I think we talked a lot about safety on this particular day too, and that to me that's um, part of consumer protection. So, you know, the type of safety requirements that we have for um, extractors or processors and, and um, what kind of training they have to have or certification they have to have before they use anything that's potentially volatile. And then the other piece for me related to safety is the banking, and maybe that's a stretch to bring this into that, but it seems like this is like, you know, predominantly cash businesses can be, I mean, there there's a risk in carrying all that cash around or having all that cash in a retail location or, you know, in, in any business. So I think that there's a safety concern as it relates to the, the cash piece of this. Yeah, ditto. Like, like I said, Julie, it, it, this is another one of those kind of overarching concepts that we need to keep in the back of our mind because it affects everything. Yeah. So for, for this one, to me, the, what, what really stuck out uh, on consumer protection is how much the current agency of agriculture has been ahead of the game on this. And they developed um, an incredible cannabis quality pr program um, at the agency of ag. It exists today. Um, it's probably understaffed a little bit, um, especially if we're going to try and rely on that. But um, they already certify labs. They have testing requirements throughout the value chain. They have labeling requirements, record keeping requirements, contaminant thresholds. They created a common vocabulary that they use in their um, in the hemp program, which has already over 400 registrants. Um, so to me, like uh, we really need to tap into that knowledge base and that experience that they've built up over the last you know five five or so years um uh they they provide um they do inspection and compliance already um they have educational programs faq guidance documents um so you know a lot of the things that i think about when i think about consumer protection are kind of you know partially built already, which is just a relief to me, but it also, you know, when you think about adding all of these new businesses, layering it on top of that, that, it, that we really need to kind of use their, their knowledge and their expertise and build upon it. Um, so, uh, and then this day we also talked about the fire safety mm -hmm. and, um, you know, where that should fall in the application process. And um, we learned a decent amount about pesticides and, and which ones you know various models I know you know it sounds like California has the most um, kind of comprehensive with their inhalation studies and you know Colorado goes a different way than Massachusetts um, so you know those are all kind of really important pieces on the on the consumer protection side that we need to be thinking about yeah and it, it, it's funny sorry I didn't pick up what you're putting down Mr. Chairman, when he wanted me to lead, since I used to be on the hemp team and help create some of those those guidance documents. I think one of the things that um, will help us in looking to the hemp program, looking to other jurisdictions, um, you know, we're, we're not the first to enter this marketplace um, in Vermont, even when you're talking about this plant more more broadly, but across the country. And we we, we can look at what's worked, what people have done well, and what people haven't done well, and not reinvent the wheel where it's it's not necessary, but recognizing that, you know, that's important from a consumer protection perspective, and and we need to, to at the same time, do something that's going to build off of what Vermont does well and what Vermont values. And the hemp program is a great place for us to start there. Okay, on that note, um, I, this is what I have. 
It is imperative that cannabis users in Vermont have the option to purchase cannabis and cannabis-derived products that are tested, labeled, and free from harmful contaminants. To achieve this goal, the board will rely on the expertise of the Agency of Agriculture to ensure minimum consumer protection standards are achieved in both the adult use and medical use programs in Vermont. Yeah, I hate that word minimum because it sounds like we're setting a low bar, but I think that's the idea is that, <laughs> you know, we need to have minimum standards that, that, uh, that can protect those can protect consumers. Yeah, I agree. I when you said that, that was my first thought too. Yeah. And I, but I can't think of a better way to say yeah. it. Honestly, we could just say standards, <laughs> but you know, we just got to set the floor, yeah. set the yeah. foundation. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. But that's great. Um, so we are at our public comment period. For the people watching, I just want to keep going. We have two left, and and um, I think we can get through them uh, with relative efficiency. Um, the medical program, we had a day dedicated to the medical program. Um, you know, the board's taking over the program in January. I think that, you know, my main takeaway here is that, well, one, just that there needs to be continuity of services and access. Um, and affordability by the patients as these dispensaries um, that are currently serving them, you know, move into the adult use space. You know, it's it's hard to know. We have, I think, 4,600 patients, give or take. And when you think about kind of economies of scale and profit motive, we just want to make sure that the the patients that rely on these um, on these services and products have access, continued access, uninterrupted access to them. And then just the, my other big takeaway is that the Vermont Medical Program really is one of the most restrictive in the country. Um, and uh, I think that when we are redrafting the rules, which we're required to do, that we need to think about whether that's necessary um, in an adult use, when we have an adult use program. And some of the restrictions, um, you know, you need a doctor referral every year, even if you have a chronic or terminal condition. Um, there's a very limited number of qualifying conditions, nothing related to mental health with the exception of PTSD, and that has additional hoops you need to jump through. You need to have a three-month relationship with your healthcare provider. There's no reciprocity with other states. Um, you're only assigned to one, dis a single dispensary or a plant caregiver. Um, there's purchasing monthly purchasing limits and um, a few other pieces that I think are important to note here is that uh, third-party testing has been something that both um, uh, our advisory committee member Meg Delia and the Vermont Trade Association has said is important as well as I think universally is important to the, the um, patients that are on the registry um, uh, increasing the patient to caregiver ratio and the plant count, um, allowing patients to purchase tax-free and adult use in retail locations has been something that's been brought to our attention. Um, eliminating fingerprint supported background checks for caregivers and reconstituting the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee to make sure that when they're advising us that we're actually hearing from, you know, nurses and doctors and patients and caregivers and not just kind of, um, you know, people that use the dispensaries and the local municipalities and uh, law enforcement. Um, so that's that's what I have on this one. I think my takeaways are very similar. I um, recall that there was no nurse or healthcare professional on staff in the dispensaries and um, making something like that available or having some sort of consistent medical education related to um, this as a symptom relief um, effort I think is important along with expanding and I think you talked about this a little bit the the conditions that qualify particularly mental health and addiction um, I don't think that I have that much else to add I think you covered most of, yeah, <laughs> most of what I've my been, notes were too I've been um, also sitting in on the marijuana for symptom relief oversight right? committee meeting so I've got kind of a wraparound uh, you know, thoughts on this. I, I know that there's nothing that we can particularly do about this now, but cannabis is not covered under health insurance. Yeah. I just feel like it's worth stating as something that I think about a lot in terms of access um, as a medication or symptom relief program. Yeah. 
Yeah, for the sake of time, I'll just I'll just echo everything the two of you just said. Um, I will say just as a general overview, you know, one thing I've heard is is with an adult use marketplace coming online, we cannot let the medical um, marijuana system and community fall by the wayside. It needs to be important, and and as we move into all of our goals, but um, recognizing that and and moving for a maybe a little less restrictive program and one that that works for the folks that want to be or need to be um, a part of that program is important. Great. Yep. Bryn? Okay. So I have, the board will ensure that patients maintain a continuity of access to the existing medical program services and will endeavor to reduce the regulatory burden that impacts patients and caregivers, reduce costs for patients, and create educational programs for healthcare pro professionals. Was there anything in there about quality? Because I think that the testing is, mm -hmm. um, is something that we've heard kind of universally. Okay. But you can kind of think where that might fit in. Okay. All right, the last, priority that we have is public safety. Uh, you know, we heard a lot about um, the DRE program, we heard a lot about crash statistics, um, and we heard a lot about safe banking. And I'll just review some of the things that came really quickly just because we're running short on time. But essentially 2020 um, was, I think, the worst year since they started keeping statistics on highway fatalities. Um, and they were most predominantly alcohol, um, but there were, I think, 20% cannabis only. Um, and that's you know worst statistical year based on a vehicle mile traveled, not not just I think strictly numbers wise. However, the numbers were pretty alarming that year as well. Mm -hmm. um, the um, highway safety plan, the state highway safety plan, um, is being redrafted this year, and it's a five year plan. Um, and I think really should involve some input from the cannabis board, maybe through our advisory committee. Um, but the current state highway safety plan calls for improving public awareness of what impaired driving is, um, increasing training for law enforcement to detect um, driving while impaired incidents, and supporting a more efficient means of collecting um, data on impaired driving. And I think that that was spoken about that a lot of the officers who are not a ride trained, I think a ride training is going to fill this gap. Um, just uh, they don't. They might see a collision um, and they don't recognize cannabis impairment there. Um, uh, the DRE program, I think it's important to note, it, you know, it, it's roughly 50 years old. It was adopted in 2005 in Vermont. In 2017, the Vermont Medical Society endorsed it. Um, there's 48 active DREs in Vermont. Um, the Northeast Kingdom is the area of greatest need. There's also need in Wyndham County. Um, 2015, A-Ride became a part of the core training at the academy, um, so that's going to help fill the gap uh, for detection. Um, with respect to data collection, I think this is related. Uh, we heard from Robin Joy from the Crime Research Group. Um, you know, she said that administrative data alone will not always tell the complete story. She talked about people's kind of feeling of safety at the various courthouses um, that were kind of people that have uh, relief from abuse orders and that you need to kind of ask the questions that might be qualitative data, but those are important to fill the gap of administrative data, um, which can be skewed by um, either improvements in data collection or kind of improvements in data quality. Um, it might not actually match reality. Um, the CCB should be clear on what data and metrics it wants to collect. Um, it should involve stakeholders in that process including um, the Agency of Digital Services and um, you know, data researchers. And we need to constantly be thinking about equity, transparency, and mapping with the other systems that we have in the state and use results-based accountability and equity analysis um, to, eval to constantly course correct and evaluate the data that we're collecting and whether it's good. Um, with respect to safe banking, I know Julie touched on this already, but um, the, you know, compliance with safe banking requires high fees for the members um, and either rescheduling um, federally cannabis is really the only thing that will uh, 
eliminate the risk uh, for the credit unions and the other banks that are associated with, with banking this industry. However, safe banking, the McClintock Amendment and others may help. Um, uh, there's only a handful of um, potential banks around the state that could bank in this space, at least initially. So the advice that we got from VSCCU and the Department of Financial Regulations was to start slow. Um, and uh, VSCCU mentioned that they're going to make a determination about their kind of involvement in this industry um, either later this year or early next year. Um, and then just one final point, Kyle, this is a question that you asked uh, and we got an answer from uh, Christian Cedarberg, which is, as far as he knows, no banks have been shut down uh, because they were banking in cannabis funds. I don't, I don't really have anything to add. Yeah. I don't either, other than you just, we've talked about education a lot, and I think yeah. particularly around banking, um, that's another place where you know participants in the market will need and want a lot of education. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Well, Bryn. Okay, this one I have a, a pretty broad statement for, which is legalizing cannabis and cannabis sales can be a harm reduction policy if done responsibly. Great. Okay. okay. Um, thank you all for doing that. I know that uh, that was kind of a whirlwind. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the meetings that we've had over the past, you know, couple of weeks in order to get us to this point, and I know you all have as well. And I think that this document will be an important one that we that we've done as we pivot to kind of our new, the new world that we're entering, the new phase. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to moving down the agenda just to try to make up a little bit of time. I'm going to open up to public comment, and I'm going to move our 10:30 um, to the. Um, kind of more towards the end. I'm going to combine it with our 1140 agenda item because I think they're interrelated. But um, for now, I'd like to open to public comment. Um, we're going to start with the people that have joined via the link. Um, and so if you have a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. And I don't see anyone joined by phone, so we'll just start with, I think that's, is that you, David Silverman? I can't read the list. Dave Silverman is okay. the first. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I, just for the for the sake of transparency, I wanted to raise this issue that's completely unrelated to your agenda today, um, but I wanted to raise it publicly in a meeting because I, I will be reaching out um, to uh, Executive Director Hare uh, via email about it. Um, I, I was talking uh, with some of our legislative sponsors of Act 164 about, a, uh, about the licensing structure because it occurred to me that um, growers and wholesalers are not authorized under Act 164 to sell seeds or clones to other licensed growers. And that seemed like an oversight to me uh, because it doesn't make much sense in a world where a grower can very easily buy seeds online um, to make them go to a retail store to buy seeds, especially if you have a, uh, you know, kind of, well-developed market with wholesalers involved and other uh, growers who are specializing in seed stock or, or clone stock. Um, the initial feedback I got from uh, the legislators I contacted was that this was uh, likely an oversight. I, I don't get the sense that it was an intentional decision, um, but I haven't spoken to everyone. Um, and um, I, I'm going to engage in a bit of a lobbying process at the legislature to try to get that change uh, because I, I think it's inefficient. Um, and, and if we require growers to get their seeds from retailers and pay the six, the 14% excise tax and potentially the 6% sales tax, we're really creating an incentive for them to purchase outside of the regulated market. And I think that undermines the sort of seed to sale tracking priority that, that y'all will want to have. So um, I'm, I'm gonna reach out um, to Director Hare with some, with some proposed language on how to fix this. I think it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, and I hope that the board uh, will agree that this is a sensible thing to do once you've had some time to look at it and think about it, uh, because I think it'll be a lot easier to get the legislature to act if um, kind of everyone's on board. And I do think this is something that ought to be relatively uncontroversial. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. 
Uh, up next, we have Marielle. Marielle, if you could unmute yourself and provide a comment. Hi, thank you, Chair Pepper. This is Marielle Matthews. I'm the Public Health Equity Manager with the City of Burlington, Vermont. I just wanted to um, underscore that you had mentioned earlier about um, providing model ordinances to help cities and municipalities understand what their local licensing structure could look like. I um, just want to provide further support for that, that that's something that we've been talking a lot about, where the lines are of what we do versus what the state does. Um, and we would definitely benefit from um, being able to see some uh, model license structures. Um, one other thing that has been on my mind is you also mentioned uh, helping, making sure that the Cannabis Control Board could be nimble to lessons learned. And that's something that we've been thinking about how to incorporate into our licensing structure as well, um, thinking about you know the differences of folks who get licenses earlier on versus folks who get licenses later, what kinds of things we're gonna learn in that time, what's gonna change, and how to keep standards the same for everyone um, in an annually renewable license structure. So wanted to underscore that point as well in thinking about a model um, license ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have Jesse Lynn. Jesse Lynn, you can, there you go. Hi, thanks so much. Um, thanks for having us here today and for all you guys are doing. A couple things I just wanted to quickly mention, please, as you discuss consumer protection and that being a priority, and thank you, I appreciate that from the medical perspective. I just wanted to reiterate what I've mentioned in another comment, um, public comment in another session you had, is that Clean Green is specific certification program to cannabis. It's the oldest in the country, um, third party certification, and they their pillar is based specifically around con both consumer and environmental protection. So just to kind of throw that out there again, because as we know, agriculture, their role and priority is not necessarily consumer protection, though I know they care a lot about it. That's not always their agenda, as well as the USDA organic program is a labeling and marketing program more so than consumer protection. So I just wanted to, as Kyle had kind of mentioned that there are some great third party organizations and they're just an example of one that can really help promote and educate on clean cannabis. Um, as to what Julie said, thank you. I always appreciate Julie, your support and understanding that we unfortunately don't have medical professionals or education in a medical program and how important that is. And also recognizing that on the cannabis advisory board, we do not have any medical professionals who are proficient in cannabis. So I think, you know, again, Julie, I just appreciate you kind of acknowledging that and recognizing that maybe we do need to find a way to have more medical professionals involved in both the advisory board or the medical program in house dispensaries. Um, and lastly, just to mention that the American Nurse Association of Vermont, they have started an education program to help healthcare providers have more of that education around cannabis because it's not something that healthcare providers have on a regular basis unless they're going out and seeking that education out for themselves. The American Nurse Association at a national level does support medical cannabis access and education around it and Vermont is you know kind of leading the charge nationally as far as hoping to be a part of that education process so again thank you for that and just to let you guys know and reiterate um, any way they can help or you know we can have more medical professionals involved i would second that and julie's comments so i think that's it thank you guys so much thank you uh tito burn tito feel free to unmute Hi there. Hi guys. Um, so I just wanted to um, talk about uh, Chair Pepper's concerns over indoor growing um, and just point out um, how there's just so many different ways to grow indoors. And um, I ran a, a lighting analysis uh, comparing uh, power usage based on a thousand square foot flowering canopy grow uh, using HPS lighting as opposed to using LED lighting. And the, the difference was staggering. I'll be happy to, show, to share this with you if the board would like to see it. Uh, it was, uh, and the power usage was, was so much less, it was, it was just shocking. And so I know Efficiency Vermont 
is uh, incentiv incentivizing um, purchasing LED lights, but I really feel like it could go a lot further. It's, you know, these lights are really um, in some cases, and it would be really cool to just see some more incentivizing by the board or the state, however that can happen, for indoor growers to use LEDs instead of HPS lights, and, um, and, and that's that. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Tito. Uh, Sherman Palm is next. Good morning. Um, as I, oh, oh yeah, my name is Sherman Hom, and I'm Director of Regulatory Affairs for Medicinal Genomics. And uh, as I, uh, since it was mentioned concerning uh, consumer as well as patient protection, I think it's very important that um, the appropriate Te a required testing for microbial contamination be conducted. And Chair Pepper, you invited me to um, submit some written statement um, recommendations. I hope you've had a chance to read what I've submitted. And again, it's very important. I, I do understand that testing can be a financial burden for the small businesses, but I think it's very important. Uh, to have the a scientific based testing and not uh, over testing for the different uh, analytes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sherman. Thanks for the kind of continued, uh, you know, uh, support for microbial testing, especially with the medical patients. Um, is there anyone else? No, the raised hand on the team flank. Did anyone join by phone? We have two numbers um, that are joined by phone. Okay. If you'd like to join, if you'd like, if you've joined by phone and would like to make a public comment, um, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, we're going to leave the public comment there. Then we'll have one more session towards the end of the meeting. Um, what we'd like to do now um, is introduce our consultants. Um, uh, from NACB, who I think I've, have joined us, um, Gina, and I think I saw Tom and, and maybe Josh, but, uh, Mark. or Mark. I saw Mark pop up. Mark, yep. So uh, NACB, uh, Gina, I'm not going to try to describe um, the kind of breadth of the areas that, that you all expert, that you all have expertise in, but it would be great, I think, for Vermonters and everyone who's tuning in to familiarize themselves with you and your organization. And maybe you could give us just a little bit of a primer on how you expect us to kind of meet the very aggressive deadlines that uh, we have before the board over the next few months. Um, and honestly, whatever else you'd like to talk about would be great. I mean, uh, we're just so grateful for your support and for the team's expertise that you're bringing into the state. Well, we are so excited to be here today and work on these guidelines with the Cannabis Control Board and with your experts um, in the advisory committee. Um, we are thrilled. I'm sure my team is saying, how are we going to meet these deadlines? Well, we are efficient in doing so, and we know that it needs to be timely. And a lot of the things that we do already at the NACB has really built a really good framework um, and just really need tweaking around it from our Vermont perspective. So we are trying to establish all of those things now. So for people who don't know the NACB, we create national standards uh, for the industry that are created by the industry. So we would work with experts um, on different subject matters we are in the process of developing cash management standards and delivery standards. We have um, lab standards already. We have cybersecurity, regular security standards. Uh, we, have, we also do guidance. So we have a social equity model that we have sent out um, to various states and those benefits. Um, we act as a resource to different state legislators and give them blueprints of what standards should look like, um, which is really helpful. And we also have a really large national perspective 
on what is working in some states, what is not working. We do a lot of analysis um, for state comparisons on different topics as well. And we are trying to create a self-regulatory framework for the cannabis industry as an entirety and provide checklists for self-orders for all those standards that we create. We right now have over 750 members that are hemp, CBD, industry professionals, their affiliates, suppliers, um, recreationally, um, and also medicinally. Um, so we also have our own advocacy advisory board that spans the entire industry, so different sectors, but also different groups, because we wanted to ensure that all the voices are being heard. And one unique thing about our association is that all of them are vetted. So they adhere to the highest standards um, out in the industry right now. And we will be utilizing all of the stuff that we have already created and the expertise that we have on our staff to bring the best recommendations um, for the state of Vermont. So I'm sure a lot of people are saying, why has Vermont gone with the National Association of Cannabis Businesses? So from our first perspective, it's that we do have a national perspective on what's happening, which is really very, very valuable because this is a brand new industry. You know, a lot of states have tested out different models of what can work and what really needs to be involved. We share very common goals. We want every we want this industry to be safe, legal, held responsible um, for both aspects of medicinal and adult cannabis use. Um, we're already shaping the industry and legalizing um, cannabis. And also we love social equity, which is I know something very near and dear to Vermont right now. It's such an important topic and I personally, this is something very near and dear to my heart and can't wait to start diving in on it. And we will be bringing on eight experts um, from our team to really help jumpstart and facilitate all of these committees. So there are a ton of people. We have right now boots on the ground, Eli Harrington. He comes in as a consultant for the NACB. And I know many of you probably know him from Greenbridge Consultancy Company. And I will also be introducing Tom Nolasco, who is our director of LEGO. And he will be in charge of overseeing the entire advisory board. With that being said, I'm gonna have Tom speak so he can give you the layout of the committee groups that um, we are creating right now and some timeframes around it what we will be discussing and developing and how fast we can get that to you. Tom? Thanks, Gina. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and, and, and the board. Uh, I'm yet another lawyer in, in this meeting. My background is I'm a commercial business litigator uh, for the past 20 years. I was first introduced into the cannabis industry probably about six or seven years ago. Now I'm in Arizona. Arizona, like Vermont, went medical first, um, and then we just went recreational this past year. Uh, so there's a lot to learn from that. But um, one of the type of thing cases I handle as, as a litigator are, are partnership disputes. And back in the day, a lot of investors wanted to get into the market. Uh, these were a lot of East Coast, Wall Street investors, and they had to cross over uh, onto the industry side. And, and that was, at the time, a pretty sketchy group. Um, and they're there were bad actors, bad players, and uh, that's what led to the partnership disputes. And then from there, um, a lot of people needed help with everything else because license holders, like everyone else, they're big startups. They have needs throughout the law, uh, employment, real estate, compliance. And so I got more involved with that. I've been with the NACB now for over two years, helping direct the creations of the national standards that Gina just spoke of. Um, and I, I've spoken on various panels throughout the years on everything uh, from legalization prospects to 280E to the SAFE Act to consulting with different political groups, including conservative groups, uh, which for me were the most fun. Those were the most contentious. Um, 
the most education that needed to happen. And obviously we've consulted with various state legislators and municipalities as well. Um, I also came out here to the desert to Arizona uh, to complete my one of my post-grad uh, degrees. I got an MBA from, from Thunderbird. Um, so I, I have some, that business at least experience as well. My only tie to Vermont um, is pretty tenuous. Um, as everyone on the call probably guessed, I was actually born and raised in Wisconsin. So not the most populous state, not the most populous city, but filled with good, pleasant, hardworking, down-to-earth people, strong farming, rural communities. So I do feel like there's similarities, cultural similarities between the states, even though there's uh, obviously some sizable distance between them. Uh, and just quickly, if I could, uh, if, if we need any inspirational um, thoughts this morning about this group, the board, the advisory committee, and those participating on the call. My personal philosophy is that this, in spite of what's happening on the federal level with Senator Schumer and the other legal, federal legalization efforts, all of which I'm skeptical of having any success in, in the short term. Um, in spite of that, the legalization of cannabis is happening as it has the past 10 or 15 years, illicitly or through state legislation. It's all being led through the states, right? And it will continue to do so. Those of you that have kept up with the federal acts, there was something called introduced called the States Act by Senators Warren and at the time, Senator Gardner. And all that was essentially was a nod to the 10th Amendment. And what it was saying was, hey, listen, if you comply with your state legislation and your state regs, we, the federal government, will leave you alone and we won't, we won't enforce. And that was a real acknowledgement to the power and effectiveness of state legislation. So when we look at this opportunity with Vermont, I mean, it's a real opportunity, not just to advance legalization as a whole, but you're setting the template for future federal legalization, future state legislation across the board, and really getting a chance to put Vermont on the map to, to have a good, robust program that works for the state and people of Vermont. And we can learn now, we can look back and learn from the mistakes of the other states that have, have legalized. So it's, it's a real, uh, real fun opportunity for us and, and we're excited to get started on that. So given that, um, yeah, there, there are some very daunting tasks ahead, especially given the deadlines. And uh, we all know, I mean, we've all experienced that just through the pandemic, there's a lot of stops and then quick starts that need to happen. So we need to start quickly uh, without question. Um, the reason for optimism, and just as a lawyer, I'm not usually an optimistic person, but I just want to give three reasons we should be optimistic here. One is that, as Gina said, we're certainly not inventing or even reinventing the state cannabis regulation wheel, right? There are other models out there from states that have worked that we're familiar with. And you also have your own state medical framework that has been in existence that we know. I don't know it as intimately as some of the other board members, uh, like Meg and some of the others that I'm anxious to speak with and frankly meet with personally if I, I can quickly. Um, second reason is the board has assembled or someone has assembled a, a very competent, good uh, advisory committee with the expertise and information that we need. So I'm confident with the knowledge and information that we have uh, that is there. I mean, really the first step is to set the proper organizational matrix um, and the proper, like any good product, functional organizational chart, that's what we need to create. And like with any good organization, if I can quickly identify the horizontal and vertical conflicts or inefficiencies that exist with that, and then make sure the relationship between the controlling authority, the board, and the liaison, and those project managers within those subcommittees works well on the line of, lines of communications that are open. Um, I, I think we can we can get this done and, and, and you know, hopefully in, in fairly short order with a good product uh, and good recommendations to come up with. So with that, I mean, the NACB is kind of diving in. Uh, we, we, we dove in and started creating uh, the subcommittees uh, based on the Statute Act 62 and what we've been tasked with as far as the scope of work that I'll go through kind of quickly now. And obviously, well, I'd like to have some follow up as quickly as I can, just communicating with the actual advisory committee members um, and making sure they're comfortable with whatever subcommittees they're on. 
um, or if they have preferences for something else or recommendations, uh, naturally we're all ears. But we created essentially seven different subcommittees um, and broken these down. And, and some of them have uh, some extensive items within them. But the, the subcommittees are social equity, market structure, licensing, taxes and fees. That's another subcommittee. Third, the sustainability sub subcommittee. Fourth, public health. Fifth, compliance and enforcement. That's the big one. Um, sixth, the medical, or I'm sorry, medicinal. And then seventh, the product safety and lab testing. And I'll go through each of these and kind of what some of the characteristics and goals are in each of those committees. So first, with social equity, obviously we have to create the program design, um, the applicant program and the design and execution of that, the criminal justice reform aspects for expungement and what we want going forward, the tax and fees structure, um, and loan support, financial programs within social equity, and then how the ongoing program administration will include the transferability of the social equity licenses. The next one, the subcommittee for market structure, licensing, taxes, and fees. Uh, we are going to get, thankfully, the, the help of Vicente Setterberg, who's already done a market study um, for the state of Vermont. But, you know, we need project projected market and taxes, projected market size and structure, the tax projections, proposed licenses, how that wants to be rolled out in a, in a state like uh, Vermont. Are there going to be tiers? What are the requirements and conditions or limitations um, for any future loans? And that, you know, this is obviously also tied into social equity um, and the percentage of licenses that will be social equity. So next subcommittee, sustainability energy efficiency standards, groundwater considerations, air quality, the types of environmental things you'd ex expect, uh, destruction, composting, conservation measures, um, and accommodations for small cultivators, economic sustainability. The next one is the public health subcommittee. This will include issues like advertising and marketing, packaging and labeling, um, any considerations for the manu food manufacturing establishments um, and other public health considerations. The next group, compliance and enforcement, and this seems to be kind of growing by the second, but this in entails a lot. So it's, it's cultivation compliance, retail compliance, things like age verification, facility inspection standards, employment, record management, buffer zones, seed to sale tracking, insurance, banking. I mean, there's a lot that falls into this one and it might even need to be broken out even further, but that's what at least we've created as another subcommittee. And the last one will be the product and safety uh, standards, things like uh, lab testing um, and, sorry, other, the, the pesticides, the potency issues uh, as well. So those are the seven subcommittees that, that we've created. Um, again, anxious to, to get rolling. We internally in the ISB already know who we want among our staff um, to be on the different subcommittees. Uh, and we, we've kind of assigned just by, you know, through paper, because that's all we know so far, um, who might be best suited for each subcommittee. But obviously, I'd, I'd love to talk or, or meet with those folks as well. Uh, and get this rolling as soon as possible because the, the way we were looking at it is with October 1st deadlines for the recommendations report, we really need to get these approved through each subcommittee um, and to the board by early September, which is three weeks away. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, we've got some feverish work ahead, but um, I think we can get the, the matrix and the functions in place where we can start moving forward fairly quickly. So I'm, I threw a lot. I'm, I'm sure there's some questions that I'm, I'm happy to answer or Gina will. Thank you. Thank you for so, that. Yeah. <laughs> or go ahead, Gina. I just wanted to add some time frames so that people will realize how quickly we're going to anticipate on doing this. Next week, we are hoping to meet with the entire board um, that the advisory 
um, committees. And then August 30th, we're going to try to bring some people in if we need some presenters for topics. Um, we'll be doing some community outreach in between them. We have already started community outreach. And then the week of September 6th, start sending material that has already been completed with recommendations and other um, information that's necessary and have our first subcommittee call hopefully that week as well and then to do hoping to do two meetings per week after that until we have all of the final completions because these turnaround dates we have our first one on October 1st and then another on October 15th and November 1st. Yeah. And, so and one thing I want to add to social equity is just to ensure that we definitely understand that this is multidimensional. You know, we're dealing with community groups that have been affected, um, but we're also dealing with people who have been impacted on the war on drugs. We don't want to just solely focus on getting a licensee into it, but how can this really be a comprehensive social equity program in its entirety. And when we speak about social equity involves so many equity out there, um, you know, definitely racial equity, but you know, um, people with disabilities, um, we're, we're talking about age, you know, people, this is very vast and wide. Um, and also we want to try to get people into entry level positions. How can we make a social equity program that is diverse and is going to be wide spectrum and not just help a few, but help the many. Um, and, you know, maybe other programs that can be involved with products or and or services that bring in social equity as well. That's a, that's a great point uh, because I think that um, as you know the war on drugs and the second and third order impacts of prohibition have taken many different forms and their kind of tentacles have reached deeply into systemic kind of structures and, and our, our society and so you know what I really was appreciative of, of Gina and the whole NACB team is that they're willing to come to Vermont um, and actually work with Vermonters and actually understand um, exactly how we can make a social equity program, specifically social equity, but the whole market structure really, that is uniquely Vermont based and, and addresses the kind of ways that prohibition and uh, the war on drugs has impacted Vermont um, and how we can kind of mitigate some of those harms. Um, the other thing that I just really wanted to stress for the benefit of folks that are watching is that these timelines that we have are very aggressive. Um, you know, we have our big report due on October 1st. In order to get that report approved and get, um, you know, stakeholder input, you know, that's why uh, Gina and Tom were talking about early September um, so we can have a product that can be reviewed by the full advisory board and can be. Um, approved by the Cannabis Control Board. Um, you know, it's just a monumental task. And um, NACB really had not just the, the kind of comparison charts of what, you know, Colorado has done in Washington and uh, California and, you know, Michigan and others. It also has um, draft model policies that builds upon um, those states, those the best practices in those states, and is vetted by people on the ground, the actual business holders, the license holders, the employees, um, and the people in the industry to say, well, yeah, this was the intention. This is how it actually ended up playing out, and this is how we would improve upon it. And you have those for every aspect of the industry. You're the only, I think, um, organization that, that we interviewed that had the capacity to come to the state, um, you know, jumpstart this, the work that we're doing, provide the context to our local folks, um, and really hopefully get a work product to us that we can approve by October 1st. Um, and I think you are uniquely situated to help us in that respect, um, which is just like, uh, just so encouraging to me. Um, that, uh, and we're just so thankful for your willingness to take this on. and. 
you know, we didn't, we're trying to keep our budgets low. It's not like we have unlimited amount of money to, um, to get this done. And I think that you guys are willing to work with us on that as well, which is also just an important side note. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to the work ahead. Tom, I think I'll just underscore something that you said is that um, you're forming these subcommittees and you're gonna have distinct members with specific expertise from NACB staffing those subcommittees, giving them the direction that they need in order to kind of in incorporating their Vermont expertise into the mix. And they're gonna have to work simultaneously. They're gonna have to work at a furious pace and they're gonna be guided by you, which I think is an important piece for everyone to remember that um, the amount of work that needs to be done is, is just uh, monumental and it's gonna take everyone kind of pulling together. So thank you. I just, I guess that's a long way of saying thank you for your willingness to do this. Hi Gina, hi Tom. Well, I just wanted to briefly echo Chairman Pepper's comments. Um, I think the plan you've got for us is is fantastic and I'm. I'm looking forward to see the implementation over the next month and a half. It's going to be a whirlwind and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yep. Well, we definitely appreciate all of you as well. I mean, you've been so helpful and, you know, giving us guidance and uh, having conversations when we need it. I know we've been on a ton of calls already and you have just such great expertise for this advisory committee. I mean, it was really easy to be like, oh, this one will be good and that one will be good. And, um, you know, anything that we can do to really help the industry move forward. Because for us, you know, Vermont implementing successful standards, you know, shows other states how to do it as well. And that's what we really are trying to do for creating these best practices is, is to ensure that we have what is needed on a day-to-day -day operations and having these expertise voices be heard. Um, and so that we don't have to continuously provide something because it doesn't work because we're doing it from, you know, sort of a textbook version. Um, so we're, we're really excited. I'm sure the advisory board may not like us by the end with all the work <laughs> we bombard on them. <laughs> um, but we really hope to get all of this done as soon as possible and into your hands. Tom. Gina, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Gina, here's a question I've been getting from a few folks is, you know, you touched on this, but who is NACB? Why did you choose them? I mean, I think you're, uh, I described that a little bit now and you did as well, but for folks that may want to do some just background research on you, are, th are there things that they should do other than just go to your website? Are there things that they can do to kind of see you all in action or uh, kind of, um, I know your social equity plan is, is you know, one of the most popular uh, pieces of your website and, you know, generates a lot of traffic, but are there other places that they, that, you know, Vermonters who are curious about NACB should, should do to kind of, you know, lift the hood, kick the tires kind of on NACB? Well, we would, uh, you know, we have um, NACB has happy hours on different topics. We also give some other educational monthly webinars. So we do a Blazers and Blazers connecting the cannabis industry with the finance industry. I know you spoke briefly upon that. We're coming out with our first cash management standards. And then um, next year we're coming out with payment processing because that's even a, a larger issue um, right now in the industry. Um, also, we have the doctor's lounge, so that's also for our medicinal cannabis. So we can send you out some information and provide this um, to some people in Vermont who would like to see us in action and do some work. Um, we have lots of articles out there. As we have a um, blogs in our on our social media pages. Um, we can upload you all of this information to send out to people of Vermont. Um, we will be at MJ Biz, so some people in October, if you'll be there, we're, we'll be there for Association Day. Um, we'll also be there. I'll be speaking on a panel on social equity about some simple ways that we can start to change the industry um, and create a more inclusive environment, a more diverse environment um, in simple things like 
you know, not requiring a college degree and just saying it's preferred or, you know, taking someone's name off when you're looking at the candidate or, you know, non-gender specific contracts, um, just to name a few of those. And we have on YouTube some videos where we did a social equity conference last year um, that people will be able to look at and view. And we been on a number of panels and committees and can send you some of that information so you can see some of the work that we're talking about and take a look at some of our templates that we have online you know all of our members follow them but we have other people follow them other associations have picked them up um we'd love to hear your thoughts on everything that we're working on great any other questions for Gina and uh, Tom while we have them here today? Um, I, I just have one. Yeah. I, I hope this is a relatively quick question, but, but <laughs> I, I think you've described before how you developed your social equity standards and it was a very inclusive process. So could you just maybe briefly touch on how you do that? Well, for social equity, the first thing that we did was a comparison analysis of what different states and different cities have done for social equity. You know, what is something that they really all could agree upon? You know, that was one of the most important things for us. Um, and then we took that and said, okay, so these are the things that they agreed upon, but what is actually needed in order for a social equity program to work? And then we brought in experts and even got some help from some governmental legislators as well and their lawyers um, looking over these things. That was entirely helpful. Um, devise a committee. Um, you know, Tom was a part of creating this and all of our experts here at NACB and expert panels. And we realized that, you know, we looked at courts. You know, why are people being lost? Uh, what are the lawsuits about? You know, wh what have they done in other industries as well for social equity? What might have they tried to do in other countries? Um, and then said, one of the things that we noticed that failed the most is accountability. You know, how can we set a program up to say, this needs to be held accountable? What does that board need to look like? And how do we get this past the finish line? Um, another thing that was really important that we noticed is to really be definitive of what a social equity candidate looks like. And obviously in Vermont, that's going to shift a little bit from what our regular model is. Um, but also, if we're going to get a social equity candidate in, how are they going to survive? What tools do they need to be successful? Because we not only want to lower the bar of entry, we want to ensure that when they enter, they will be successful. Because what, you know, we're gonna be shooting ourselves in the foot if we don't ensure that what the whole purpose of this is trying to make their lives better. Um, another thing that we really did and we had noticed is that there are some states who allow people to opt in. So, oh, well, we're not going to deal with social equity in this county, but um, some other ones will. And so we need to make sure that this was very inclusive. What do we do about people who are incarcerated? Um, you know, what are the expungements afterwards? What are these records? Because that is part of social equity to be able to rebuild their lives, um, which some states really haven't dealt with. Um, then we, one of the most important things to, for me was about tax revenues going back into communities, because I think at the essence of all of this is to change the lives of people. And if we can just get a couple of candidates in for, with a license, it wasn't going to change the root cause of the problem. So we recommended that 20% of tax revenues goes back into these disproportionately impacted communities on the war on drugs in order to support them for education, counseling, community outreach um, programs, and even legal aid. So that was, those were all some major things that we thought were vitally important. Um, and we're, we went to community groups, we went to experts, how much money do we really need? 
um, really to try to get a true assessment of overall what was needed to create this. Um, one of the things that we really want to hope and do is to speak to people about social equity when we're creating this. We've had a couple of phone calls already and we're just, you know, we want to hear your story. We want to see what you've been going through. I think this is really important to hear the truths because it helps us be able to create a plan that is going to be Vermont focused and really beneficial to all. And we're going to be doing that with all of our standards. We've already spoken to some community groups already just based on because that is the most important thing in assessing any program is what does the state of Vermont need? Thank you. I just, I, your work product is so great, what I've seen on your website, and I, I think process is important, so I appreciate you kind of detailing that because I, I like the way that your team approaches their work. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, you know, we constantly are revising our standards as well if we see that there is definitely a trend or there's some court cases. I know you're seeing some court cases around social equity, the major one being, um, quote, quotas um, for different minority groups. So we made sure to stay away from that that we're seeing in Ohio. Um, and obviously we're looking at the one in Illinois as well. Um, but I, I think, you know, we just need to choose, are we going into a point system or are we going to lottery um, and just stick to that one. But, you know, always it's like, you know, because this is just a new industry, we're constantly needing to be on the top of the news, on top of court cases, to ensure that, you know, the state of Vermont or any of the um, people that we have out there are saying, you know, they don't fall into those traps. Thank you. Okay. Well, this was, uh, go ahead, Gina. I was just thinking of giving some overall process and not just what we did with social equity models, but um, how we create a standard. And um, so it is quite a lengthy process. Um, so, you know, we start out our standards when we get um, our primary advisor, our primary expert who's working with Tom, myself, and some of the other team members. And then we're doing research. So we're research what different states are doing. We may research um, what has been done in different industries, different countries, um, and we start with that initial draft. Then we have an expert committee, so more experts on that topic um, to go through it and then continue to edit and revise and make sure that any standard that we're doing is very comprehensive. You know, we just don't want to focus on one thing. We really want to focus completely as much as possible on that topic. After that process, we then bring it to our standards governance board and our advisory advocacy board. Um, so that entails all of our members. Once we have biweekly meetings, and then once that draft is finalized, we have an open public comment period that lasts for two weeks. So we send this out into the industry and we try to get people's opinions. We may send it to a different uh, additional experts if that is necessary. Um, and then we will have a final meeting to say we need to edit, revise based on the public comment period time. Then NACB's members then get to vote on it um, for approval. So the entire thing is, is, is very extensive but it allows the industry's voice to really be heard. And I, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we really need to hear. That's great. Yeah, I think that's exactly the process that we'd like to see play out here. And, you know, what's so helpful to us is that you've already been doing this, you know, you've been doing it all around the country. And so um, we have a, a strong foundation, which with, uh, we can jump from um, as we move into this new phase of the board's work. I mean, as you know, Gina, we've been doing kind of thematic meetings over the past uh, what, two or three months to really understand what the Vermont system should look like. And now you can help us tailor 
um, kind of the specifics uh, to to what we've learned. So I'm just I'm thrilled that we're going to be working with you and and Vincente Cedarberg is our other consultant. Um, they've got a little bit more of a discrete task than you all do. Um, and we'll introduce both of you to our full advisory panel next week um, at our meeting on August 18th. Any other questions for Gina and Tom? We are really. <laughs> we are definitely excited to meet all of the advisory committee members. We've been doing our own research on finding out about everybody. And, you know, please, if you would like to us to speak to some of your constituents, you know, please reach out to the Vermont Contro Control Board and we would love to speak to you about different topics. We're here. We want to we want to hear everybody's voices. This is what makes a good um, recommendation for the state of Vermont. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, if everyone heard that last part, but if you want to talk to Gina and her team, please um, go to our website, ccb.vermont.gov, and uh, click on our public input form, and we'll do our best to make sure that uh, if you have questions, that those get answered. Um, so um, I'd like to, if you don't mind, Gina, I'd like to kind of shift back to you know the our agenda. I think um, that was fantastic. We look forward to working with you, but. Um, I wanted to talk just about what our next meeting is going to look like a little bit and then talk about kind of how we intend to comply with open meeting laws as we move into this new phase of work, both from the um, cannabis board perspective and from our advisory board and the subcommittees of the advisory committee, um, which is uh, complicated. So I'm just going to shift to that if you don't mind. Um, I think. Uh, it's pretty clear to us that this is an incredibly amount of short, this is an incredibly short amount of time to do a lot of work. And as you know, Tom was mentioning that, and Gina, that we're gonna kind of break the advisory committee up into subcommittees. Um, we're gonna be doing that at our next meeting, which is um, uh, August 18th, it's next Wednesday, it's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and, uh, you heard just kind of a brief overview of what the committee stru subcommittee structure is going to look like. Um, at our next meeting, we'll actually be assigning people, um, our various four, uh, various members of our 14 member advisory committee to those subcommittees. We'll be introducing the members from NACB and Vincente Cedarberg that will be staffing those committees and we'll give um, them um, at that meeting specific timelines um, and deliverables um, for their work product. Um, and all keeping in mind that we have kind of these future deadlines that are in Act 164 and Act 62 that we have to meet starting with our October 1st fee structure. And we have some subsequent recommendations due on the 15th and, and, Nove and in November. Um, so that is the basic structure of our next meeting. We're gonna do some additional training with our subcommittee um, on open meeting law compliance, public record act compliance, ethics trainings, um, inclusivity and diversity trainings, um, and equity trainings. Um, but it'll be a pretty substantive meeting, I think. Um, and uh, you know, the subcommittees are going to have to meet uh, pretty regularly. I think um, they have to meet in order to get some of their work done, you know, multiple times a week. Um, and uh, so I think we're going to keep a close eye on what the best practices are with respect to um, uh, physical meeting spaces and being in the same room and masking guidelines and also kind of really keep track of any state guidance that comes out and people's kind of personal comfort um, with physical meetings. Um, the subcommittees um, will comply with the open meeting laws. Um, they will be posting agendas, um, you know, dates and times of their meetings, um, agendas, um, physical locations. There will be a physical location um, for the subcommittee meetings. They will be open to the public to attend. Um, there will be public comment periods. Um, NACB is committed to um, taking minutes and, and posting them to our website. 
Um, the thing is, we really do not have the staff um, to live stream those events um, or record them. So uh, we're not going to be doing that, which is not a requirement of the public open meeting laws. Um, that being said, the board um, will hold weekly meetings um, in our kind of traditional format, which is this hybrid style of streaming and in person. Um, and these meetings, I think uh, it's pretty clear, especially from our conversation earlier today, that it's hard to separate one issue from another. You know, even though we're going to have subcommittees, it's hard to kind of think of a tax structure without also thinking about regulatory compliance and how much that, or the fee structure, and thinking about regulatory compliance and how much those interplay with one another. It's it's hard to know, um, you know, market size and you know fee structures when you don't know, have a definition or understanding of what a social equity applicant is or how many folks uh, might be included in that. So um, the board is going to hold weekly board meetings to kind of consolidate um, and um, and really just kind of think about all of the work of the subcommittees um, and the work that's being produced by them. Um, the full advisory committee will meet on a regular schedule. I think we have it set for once a month. Um, and um, those will all be in this hybrid style where we're streaming, recording, and posting, but also allow in-person attendance and public comment. Um, and then the last thing is also the board um, is going to be adopting a regular meeting schedule dedicated to public comment, hearing from people of the public. Um, that will occur after hours um, in order to um, increase access to the board. Um, and we are currently thinking that that will happen uh, the first Tuesday of each month um, from 6 to 8 p.m. And so folks can come um, after work and really kind of have access to the board and, and make uh, maybe extended public comment. Um, so that's, that's the plan. Obviously, you know, we're keeping a close eye on the, the Delta variant, the Lambda variant, whatever else is going on, and it, things might need to shift, but um, that's kind of how we're planning on complying with open meeting laws and, and the kind of timeline for the next few months. Um, I know NACB <laughs> has a slide that they'll be presenting uh, next week, which really lays out the timeline of subcommittee meetings, advisory committee meetings, and uh, board meetings, and the kind of work product that needs to be delivered. So it'll be um, it'll be an interesting meeting to see to see that as well. Any questions from the board on any of that? That's great. Very comprehensive. Thank you. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Well, today is a somewhat uh, abbreviated um, meeting um, because really we're trying to kind of shift focus and, and pivot to the next phase of our work. And that really starts next week um, with our advisory committee meeting and then the subsequent sub subcommittee meeting. So I would be happy to kind of move down the agenda. I think the last thing that we have to do today is we wanted to do one more public comment session so again, if you have comments for the board um, and you've joined via the link, please just raise your virtual hand. It's Marielle. Marielle. Thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I just wanted to provide one comment on tax structure from the public health perspective. Um, my again, I'm Marielle Matthews, the public health equity manager with the city of Burlington, Vermont. Um, my area of expertise is specifically in point of sale related to tobacco, alcohol, cannabis, and food. Um, I one of the lessons that we've learned from tobacco from the public health perspective is that um, it's important to have taxes be directed towards prevention. Um, and treatment um, of substance use disorder that we expect to see, basically the consequences that we expect to see from the emerging market. Um, one of the things that states have done that um, has gotten some folks um, in a regrettable situation is devoting tax dollars as, devoting tax dollars to funds that should really be 
funded through separate dollars, such as education, parks and recreation, or diversity, equity, social inclusion programs. And so I wanted to raise that as a red flag, something that we're considering here as um, we think about um, tax structures and how best to fund um, an equitable business program um, that doesn't create a perverse incentive to have more retailers in the market or have higher sales volumes, the things that would generate more taxes that would um, get into these funds. And so I wanted to uh, bring that up as a red flag of you know, having states got getting into that situation and then trying to back out of it is really difficult um, to say, oh, we realize, you know, we need to regulate our market more and now we can't, we, we're facing all this pushback because it basically means cutting funding to a fund that we really um, desperately need. So I know that that's, that was just one small piece of the social equity presentation, but I wanted to bring that up and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. We have Dave Silverman next. Uh, Dave, you uh, able to join? Yeah, um, thank you, Chair Pepper. Um, I, I was alarmed just now to hear um, you say that, that there's not going to be streaming of the subcommittee meetings. And uh, I, I understand the, the staffing issue. You know, I've, I've, I've said publicly and privately that you guys are very much understaffed. I get that. Um, but uh, if there's not going to be streaming of, of these very important subcommittee meetings, I think that's going to discourage public input in a way that um, A, is, is not beneficial to the public, but B, is going to make the work product uh, at the end of the day be not as good. Um, so I really want to encourage you to try to find a way to get these things uh, onto a live stream so that we can get uh, maximize participation, particularly when we have multiple subcommittees meeting throughout the week, uh, and it's just not possible for folks who are not in the uh, Montpelier area to physically be there, um, and uh, you know, folks who have uh, other jobs and things like that. You know, I I don't want to I I don't want to see this. I don't think you want to see this uh, end up be a situation where the only people providing public comments are the professional paid lobbyists. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Tito. Tito. Um, hi there. I have to. I was going to say something different, but I have to agree with um, with uh, David Silverman on that point. Um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed being able to uh, be a part of these meetings, and it, it really does mean a lot uh, for also just you know for the the trust of the whole system working. Um, but uh, what I wanted to go out saying was just. Uh, the importance of the thousand square foot craft license referring to flowering canopy. I think that's the only way uh, that that the, the small Vermont grower can be competitive in this future market. And furthermore, I think it's extremely important that all licenses have unlimited veg canopy. Um, it, it's just so important for 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 having a full productive crop each time. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thanks. Uh, Jesse Lynn Dolan. Jesse Lynn. Oh. I think it's working. All right. Um, all right. Thanks again. I know I apologize. I always chime in, but I wanted to thank Silverman and Tito for speaking to that and reiterate that with the advisory board or the subcommittees as of right now, we don't know, you know, from our understanding, we don't know what those subcommittees are going to include. I agree and want a second as a patient and as a patient advocate and representative and as a caregiver for me to have access to these meetings has been so important and crucial and I'm very grateful for that. So I would hope that that is something we can look at moving forward that the advisory board committees or these subcommittees um, may be open at least, you know, for us to see or access or have some kind of public comment so that they do have access to more of the kind of communal communication and our interests and thoughts as well, please. So thank you. Anyone else? Not currently. Um, we have two folks on the phone. Um, if you join by the, the phone, by the phone, and you want to make a public comment, please, um, you can do that by hitting star six to unmute yourself.
Okay. Um, we'll stop public comment period. I would just I would just note, um, you know, based on the concerns that we've heard, that uh, it really does come down to a staffing issue for us um, on the streaming question. I would uh, also say that, you know, the subcommittees can't make any decisions on their own. All they can do is funnel recommendations up to the board. And then the board, uh, you know, will hold weekly meetings to review the recommendations that are being made. Those will be streamed. Those will uh, include public comment. Um, and so there is an opportunity for the public to have that increased access um, directly with the board. Um, and then anything that the advisory committee does will also be um, streamed uh, as well. So um, that's just kind of a summation of kind of our thinking on that. But um, anyway, uh, turning back to the agenda, I think the last thing we have to do is to adjourn. Is that correct? Yeah. I think yeah. So. Um, so I take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. This meeting is no longer being recorded or transcribed.